thank you for everyone that's coming out today. This is day 18. It means there's only 12 more days to go for this particular session. After this, I'm going to turn 30 days to $2,500 into a different kind of uh, course. Uh, there's the online platform, and then there's the Facebook group. There's going to be some really hot stuff that's coming that way, but we'll discuss that later. Let's get ready to rock and roll. If this is your first time to 30 days to 2500 you'll need a few things. Possibly your iPad, your phone, something to write things down with, pen, paper, because this course is about action. Uh, every day there's something for you to do, and these, and also you'll need a calendar. Because the task or objectives are becoming a little bit more complex. So with that, we're going to rock and roll. See, I told you. You need that sheet of paper, pen and pencil, calendar. And I usually start off the day with one of the tasks from the last webinar. Because there are currently 17 webinars before this one. And each one hooks in to the other webinar. The first leg is a little easier, then it gets harder and harder and harder. We're almost to the end of the third, the second leg, which is very, very exciting because this is going much better than I anticipated. So this was one of the tasks. Create a list of 50 concepts that you think, and let's really talk about that, that you think will make money. You know, because what people tend to do is limit how they respond to life excuse me, otherwise known as playing it safe. So if you have an idea or something, just put it out on the paper and pull it out of your brain and look at it. Stretch yourself. You can have some fun with this exercise if you treat it the right way. Booyah! We start off every day with this. I need your word. A pledge to make myself better today than I was yesterday. Day by day, I will become the hustler I know I can be. I am all in. I take this very, very seriously. This is mapping, programming your mind for success because you're actually saying something to you and you're going to stir up some of those juices and energy and make things happen the way they should happen. Day 18. The last few days we've been talking about sourcing, which is more on the resale tip, and this is going to be the last day of this, but it's something that a lot of people get themselves in trouble with. I've been there because if you don't source stuff, you have nothing to sell. And that's really where many people find me on YouTube before I kind of change my business model. But you have to rethink your smalls because that is one of the things that I see is a problem for many, many resellers. The smalls are wonderful and easy, but they can overwhelm you and actually bankrupt you if you're not careful. <laughs> I saw that picture. I had to do it. Those guys are cool. I don't care what you say. I mean, especially the one with the afro. He's like, I will kick your ass. Most people start with the smalls. And for obvious reasons, they're easy to get. You may have a bunch of stuff in your house that you really don't need. And for definition purposes, smalls are clothing, purses, shoes, and some other things that I'm going to call smalls that you may think, well, that's not a small, but my ideal of a small is after selling a generator that was 20 feet long, 10 feet high, and had to be unmounted and on a trailer after selling that, a lot of those things became small to me. And that's about your perspective. But there's nothing wrong with starting with smalls. Everyone's got to start with something. You got to start somewhere. You got to have that beginning point. That's not the problem. The problem is most people stay with smalls. In my book, which uh, if you were on, yeah, you should have gotten the link because I got a lot of people. Because just to let you know, the garage sale book thing is done. Because the thing is, you have to be part of the webinar. And then I was getting all these emails from people I know they didn't go to the webinar. So I appreciate you sharing with your fellow man. But see, this is the thing. And I want you to really hear me on this. I don't care that you share the link with one of your friends. That's not the problem. If they didn't want to come or haven't come, they're not going to do anything with the book. That's the problem. They're not going to do anything with it. There's, there's not. You know, I'll talk about that in a future webinar. But essentially, 
the way that this is set up where you have to sign up every day, it makes you aware. And it's, it's, it's a little wearing on you. It's a little draining because it commands something called a commitment. And people don't like to commit. It's like, I want to keep my options open, man. I don't really want to be tied that. You can't get your cash tied up until you get tied down frequently with some type of commitment. A commitment is not forever and forever. It could just be for a month or it could be for a year. It could just be for a couple of years. But a lot of people really don't want to make that commitment to anything. But back to the smalls. People stay with the smalls. And it becomes a mindset, because this is something I saw going back to what I was talking about with the storage auction book. There's a passage in there where I was talking about something I noticed over and over again is people bought storage units based on what they could move more so than the value of the storage unit. And I started seeing this because we would fight before I became educated before being educated about storage auctions we would fight for these five by fives five by tens smaller units because we can move them with our cars or you know move them with a small pickup truck and then we would pay back in the day 50 to 150 dollars for these rooms whereas the big boys would get like a 10 by 20 which had three four five sometimes 20 times more stuff for two or three hundred dollars one day I just swung for the fences and I got one of those units and it was great. I paid like $250 for it. And I just noticed that people were paying $50, $100 bucks for units that had a third of the stuff or one fifth or one. It was just like, whoa, you just get more bang for your buck with the bigger units. And I just, and I was just thinking, okay, why are people doing this? And I didn't really start thinking about why people were doing it until I wrote the book because I was glad they were doing it because it was less people competing on the large units because they didn't wake up. Because the thing is, this kind of goes back to some of the earlier days with infrastructure. You're not buying to make money. You're buying on capacity. And that's what happens when people buy smalls. They buy on capacity and they get stuck. I've seen some very smart people. I've seen some long-term eBay sellers. And you will hear that. I love plates or, you know, I love all this antique stuff. Well, let me tell you something. I sold an antique printing press that had to be put on a truck for 3200 bucks on eBay. And that was an antique, and that was a novelty. Uh, I sold signs that were like 16 feet long, metal signs from you know, on eBay. That's antiques. So the whole thing is like, oh, I'm staying with this because I like this stuff. No, no, you're staying with it because you're comfortable with it. That's why you're staying with it, because you're comfortable with it. And over time, habits become very hard to defeat. So you have these people, I, I would see it all the time. How do you think I was able to go out and find three eBay sellers and pitch them a serious, I'm going to call it a pimp deal. I'm going to call it for what it was because our deal was they got 20% and I got 80% after fees. And most people are like, no, no, I'm doing all the listing. I'm doing all this. No, the biggest problem that most eBay sellers have is finding stuff. If someone came to you, and let's just talk about percentages, because this is, a, this is a test. This is only a test. If this was real life, you'd be shot. But would you rather have 70% of $100, or would you rather have 20% of $100,000? It's a no-brainer. 20% of $100,000 $20 versus 70% of $100 is $70. That's what happens to many people. It's like, I can get all of it. It's smaller. I don't have to pay anyone. That is thinking small because smalls produce small thinking. Now, there are some people who, who sell smalls, but they sell a thousand or two thousand or three thousand a month. They're thinking big because they figured out the volume game. But you have to really, really be careful about this because so many people get stuck in this and they cannot move on. Oh, another thing that happens if you're new that bull, you'll see him again and he's coming for your ass like the big penis in the sky. If you have a business, if you're new, this is going to be hard, but if you have a business, down to the penny, how much inventory do you have on hand? This is a task. If you sold it all tomorrow, how much would you make? Your assignment is to answer those questions this week. Answer your questions. That's your assignment. Because this is something you should know, but during consulting, I've done a lot of consulting lately, I'm running into a lot of people, they don't know these questions. 
And if you don't know these questions, these are part of critical metrics to the health or death of your business. Because if you haven't done this, you may have a goal of, say, 5000 a month. But if you add up everything that you had and if you sold it, you would only come up to $3,200 a month, which means you're, you wouldn't meet your goal if you blew everything out and you're certainly not going to sell everything. You're only going to sell a percentage of what you have on hand. So if your goal is to make $5,000, you probably need to have fifteen dollars to $30,000 worth of inventory on hand. And a lot of people miss that. So that's your assignment. Yes, I love that bull. The bull is my friend. He likes me. Now let's talk about the small some more. Now all smalls are not created equal. Like you can have, I bought a unit and I got it from an old sugar art place and there was some Franklin Mint paperweights of the presidents. Small, easy to ship, they're going for $150 to $350 a piece. There was six of them in a the unit and the unit cost me 600 bucks. So those little bad boys Covered the cost of the unit, made me a profit. But as our storage auction business matured, we started focusing on larger stuff. That was why, you know, like when we had the dollar section, I'll tell you how that happened. It was a struggle with my partner because there were things in that dollar section that, you know, if you, you know, we still had the business and we were still doing that, you could come in there and buy for a buck and turn around and sell it for 10, 20 bucks on eBay. Maybe even 30. Uh, there's stuff that slipped through. Sometimes I put good stuff over there just to see how fast people would find it. And then they're going, but that's crazy. Why didn't you put it on eBay? Why didn't you? Because we were getting inventory so fast. There was no way that we could properly put it all in the channels. And this is something about eBay. If you have, you know, unless it's a hot product, if you have like 50 of the same item, it's a slow seller, people are going to start giving you low ball offers because that's one of the things we learned. So, we made a value proposition. We knew every month we were going to get clothing. We knew we were going to get towels. We were going to get sheets. We were going to get microwaves. We knew that we were going to get a bunch of items so fast that we could not sell it at the appropriate price points, which created another problem. Space issue. Eventually, we could have sold it for those prices, but it may have taken two or three months, which means I wouldn't have bought the units that I would have bought and would have slowed down from 25 to 50 units to 1 to 10, which, you know, from a conservative mindset, it doesn't sound that bad. It doesn't sound that bad. It doesn't sound that bad. So, yeah, okay. But see, this is the problem. The more that you buy, and we'll talk about turn, we'll talk about turn later, the luckier you become because this happened over and over and over and over because we bought in volume. I would go out and buy like 10, 15 units, spend anywhere from two to 6,000 on those 15 units. Then I would go out and buy another unit and spend you know 100, anywhere to 1,000 on that one unit. And that one unit would make us $10,000. So what happened? Those other units that I bought before that one unit, I could sell them at whatever price I wanted to and it was all profit, which means, hey, go to the email list, we're having a sale blowing that stuff out because it was all profit because of the term and because of our inventory flux. We knew we were going to get microwaves. We knew we were going to get sheets. We knew we were going to get clothing. We knew we were going to get shoes, soap, dishwasher. We knew we were going to get so much of that stuff. And instead of dumping it or throwing it away, we came, well, it was me. I will raise my hand because my partner fought me on it. It's like, if we just put in a dollar section and increase that section, we had people spending fifty to a hundred dollars in that section every weekend. People would come with boxes, uh, laundry baskets. Folks would like come up like, "I got two hundred pieces. We take a hundred bucks, sure." Because you have fifteen people that do that, and we did it frequently. That's fifteen hundred dollars right there, just from the dollar section. And the people with the onesies and twosies. So, by looking at our smalls appropriately, we were able to come up with a better solution than trying to hold on. To them, baby. I'm holding on to these smalls. I'm going to get my money. I'm going to. You're actually losing money. And many people get caught up in that because you can't put anything else in your space until you get rid of that stuff. And you could be turning and find something better. Also, think about the power of your smalls. Going back to the Ben Franklin paperweights. 
uh, they were crystal too. They were they're just beautiful, just beautiful. They have power. So if you can go out and source a hundred smalls and your cheapest selling price is a hundred dollars, it's a small, but it's a powerful small. It's like this, you know, it's how big is your gun? Everyone talks about how big is your gun. If you know anything about reloading and reloading is the science of putting bullets together to be really simple. If you know that if you reload your own rounds, you can use a different powder, you can use a different bullet. So your 38 may be twice as powerful because you've got different grains in there, different powder, you got a hollow point, you have a jacket hollow point. So it's a small round, it's the same as the size as this other 38, but this one with the hollow point and the higher power is twice as effective in terms of stopping power. So a lot of people figure on, you know, when I say gun, I want you to think of gun as how many smalls you have. You've got all these smalls, right? You got you got thousands and thousands of smalls. But how many of those smalls have power that you can flip and make a hundred bucks? So you can flip and make two hundred, or you can flip and make three hundred. Or you can flip one of my clients sells ten things on eBay and Amazon. Ten. Just ten. But the cheapest price is three hundred dollars. So that's and this is something that if you are in resale and you and you're paying attention, everyone seems to move into this direction sooner or later, because it just hits you one day. It's like I just spent three hours here at the flea market and I made five hundred bucks. Okay, I had a garage sale in my garage and I had a bunch of heavy hitters, two hundred items, dollar items, three hundred dollars, four hundred dollars, and I made six thousand dollars out of my garage in the same amount of time. It's all about your products. If you can sell a dollar product, you can sell a hundred dollar product. If you can sell a hundred dollar product, you can sell a thousand dollar product. Yes, you, the guy in the back and you, the girl over there peeking over the screen. Yes, all of you can do that. So it's really about the impact of what you have more so than how much of it you have and so on and so forth. Now, I'm going to give you a really great example of what I'm talking about turn here. Because many people kind of miss money because they're looking at it the wrong way. Now, that's a Haywood Wakefield chair. And I put that up there because I found it because I bought a unit that has six of those bad boys in it. I was able to sell those suckers for 700 bucks a piece. They were in prime mint condition. You couldn't tell they were new. They were wonderful. Sold them all to the same person. Now, that's a small to me. This is what I was talking about. Like, well, that's a small, that's a chair. That's a small to me because you can ship that. If you know how to ship it and you've got a shipping account, you can ship that pretty quick, easily. Now, this is an iPhone 4S. Two smalls, right? Now, I want you to think about something. If you could get 100 of these chairs and you could get 1,000 of these phones, which one would you get? And the thing is, um, I checked these chairs are selling for like four to five something on eBay currently and I iPhone 4s let's go clean ESN no crack screen everything you can get one something to two something which one would you get I would take the iPhones hands easily because I can go right now take that iPhone put it up on Craigslist for 200 bucks and that sucker someone's gonna call me in minutes Minutes. I could, if I had those, I could sell 10, 20 of them a day. Easy. Profiting, you know, 200, you know. It's easy. Easy. I could sell them that fast. Uh, another one of my clients, actually, this is, you know, I, I will talk about this because she didn't have a business. And we, we kind of had this conversation because for me, I feel that my consults are more effective for people that have businesses, but she wanted one anyway and she paid the money and we went through the process. This is why I'm using this iPhone. She and she's a married woman, a family of five. There's four kids, four kids, and the youngest one's 15. And, you know, she's at that point where, you know, she's not needed that much. And she's just like looking at what can she do? Because, you know, she came across a YouTube channel. She's watched it. Her husband lets her do whatever. So we did this whole inventory thing. And she had in her house... 
because her husband thought she was nuts for you know paying for the consult, and this wasn't too long ago. She paid the four fifty. In her house, she had twelve iPhones, twelve from generation one up to four, because you know every time they get a new iPhone comes out, everybody switches out, right? And she put the all. She had the chargers. She had the boxes. She had everything. She put all of them on Craigslist. She sold all of those phones in one day. One day. Made $2,200 off all those phones. Her husband was shocked. She's in the process of going around her house. She's making, you know, once again, these are well-to-do. They have a lot of stuff in their house. But she's making about $1,500 to $2,000 a week selling shit that she has in her house. She is hooked. And, you know, she's set up for another consult because I set up a plan for her. But I'm just telling you the power of turn. Turn is more important than price of profit. And a lot of people don't get that. Because it's like, yeah, you know, I got this item. It's $4,000. What if it takes you two years to turn it? Now, if you can turn that $4,000 item in a week or a few matter of days, hey, and I'll tell you something else. And a lot of people won't do it. If you can get an item and you know you can turn it fast, you know you can turn it fast. Let's say they want a thousand, but you're only gonna make thirteen hundred. But if you know you can get your thirteen hundred, your three hundred dollars profit in twenty four hours, you do it. That's great money for twenty. That's that. That's awesome. And a lot of people really, really miss that because they focus on the item more so than the term. Going back to the four thousand square feet where everything was a dollar. Because we put in things in there as a dollar, it created a great amount of turn for us to clear that stuff out because we would have choked on it. I mean, seriously, we would have choked on it. And after my partner, because I remember the first few weekends weren't that good when we were doing the upscale garage sale. I mean, it were, the turnout wasn't that great. It took about six weeks for it to really catch on. And I remember that first day that we did 6200 bucks. And when we looked at the paper, $4,000 came from the dollar section, which looked like hell. I mean, stuff was missing. There was big holes, boxes, paper. It just looked like a big party. I mean, it was just all messed up. And she was like, wow. And the thing is, I had 10 units I had to pick up. That week, picked them up. Dollar section was full again and did it again. And then, you know, it's just a power of turn because, you know, once again, it's hard to wrap your mind around Letting an item go for a dollar that you can sell for 10 or 20. But if you, and the thing is, a lot of that stuff, we, we pay nothing for it. Because I bought units on big stuff. Like, I'll give you a, a quick rundown of how I would buy a certain unit. It was a body unit, and I knew from the tails they had three bedroom sets. At the time, we were selling bedroom sets for three to 500 bucks. So I was like, okay, so even if the sets are crappy, it's like $900 just on the bedroom sets. Even if they're crappy, crappy meaning they may be incomplete or may just be a bed without the dresser. So if they're complete, that's 500 maybe 600 bucks. So I was looking at 900 to 1500 just on the bedroom sets. So I was like, okay, I could spend 750 very comfortably and not worry about losing any money and know that I'm going to double. And then I buy the unit and there's, there's the bedroom sets, make 1500 pay 750 for the unit. $750 profit off the bedroom set, then the rest of the stuff, I can sell whatever and it's still profit. And, you know, that's just about that turn. And that's why I learned from Dave Spivey and some other people that certain things you turn very fast and there's certain things that you hold on to. Now, this is another thing about turn. Now, this, some of this information is going to seem a little conflicting. So if you have a question, and I don't think I put that up here. If you have a question, you can go ahead and ask it and I'll answer it once I get out of the presentation. There's some things that are the slow burn. They're like, okay, that's a Rolex Daytona. I am not a big Rolex fan, but if I ever owned a Rolex, that would be the one. Those are eight to 15 grand. And that's like used, 8,000 used. If I came across that in a unit, I would not be in a hurry to get rid of it. Because another thing, Rolex Daytonas are very hard to come by. They're very rare. So, I wouldn't be in a hurry because the few I've only come across two in storage units and one was broken and I sold that for thirty five hundred bucks. It had all kinds of issues. Another one was fine and that one went for like eight. And the one that went for eight, it took four months to sell it. 
Because and this is the reason why I wasn't known as a watch guy. If I had like a watch ID with high end watches, it would have went much faster. So I didn't. Uh, it took a while for someone to have that kind of trust and like, well, the feedback's good, but what does this person know about watches? So I just sat on it. There was no reason because that's a small that you can like you know, you can go for the small burn because once again this goes back to your exercise. How many items do you have? What are your price? I knew that I could just sit on that for a year. I mean, I was prepared to sit on that for two years. No problem. Didn't take up a lot of space. And I knew sooner or later I was going to get the money. So there are certain items, once you do your market research, I knew the watch was rare. I knew it was also highly desired by a lot of people. So it, it sold much faster than I thought it would. So there are certain things that you can do that. That's when you can, you know, you can play the long money game. That, you know, if I got to hold this for six months, when I bought the safe, that had the uh, Cougar Rands and stuff, and it took me six months to sell that stuff. There were some things that I just took my time with, but they were smalls. They were those 357 hollow point, high low grain bullet with metal jacket rounds. I mean, it was just because I had, I could have sold all that stuff for about 10, 15 grand in two days if I was just in a hurry to get rid of it. But I took my time. I met with people. I did research and I got my full measure. So, there's certain items, and you're going to know what these items are based on your research. There's certain antiques that, hey, um, you know, this is another thing. If you get certain antiques, there's like major antique auctions around the country. They only happen Thanksgiving Day, New Year's Day, Fourth of July, Memorial Day. And if you find these auctions, it may be worth for some of the things you have to take to these auctions because oh, they're going to have high attendance and people are coming to buy. So... You can do the slow burn, long money game with higher quality merchandise. You, you could easily do that. There were certain things that I remember I found this unit and I got it real cheap and it had doll house furniture from the 50s. Now, I said doll, like D-O-L-L. -L. It was a doll house and it had the furniture. But when I was looking at the front, the furniture wasn't like, I mean, the furniture was exquisite. It was carefully crafted. The detail was awesome. I was just like, I didn't even, it, it didn't have a freaking name on it. And I did some research, and there were people who had dollhouses made for their kids that were custom made. And I just put up on eBay, and I broke it up. I had the dollhouse, I had the furniture, because I didn't sell it all together. I was like, I had separate lots for this. I had like, oh, this is the living room furniture. Oh, this is it. Same person bought everything. That stuff collectively went for 4600 bucks, and they came to Georgia and picked it up. I mean, you know, and it just, I had to relist that stuff like four or five times because that people would buy, would pay, but it was a slow burn. It was some worth sitting on and not lowering your price. But there's a lot of things that you will know from your research if it's this type of item. Because I've seen so many people do the actual converse. They'll get something like this watch. They'll get some nice furniture and they'll sell that fast, real cheap because they need to get some money and then try to get max profit out of the bullshit. It's a frustrating experience. I've done it before. I've been there. You're like, God, man, why did I sell all the good stuff so cheap? You sell your crap cheap. You blow it out. You give it away and you hold on to your good stuff. And this is how you develop an inventory of quality merchandise because it is so easy to fall into that trap. Now, this is a big thing. I'm going to actually do, at some point, for Hustle University, a warehouse video. But when should you hold on to inventory? Because this is a big question, because I see people I slash and burn. And sometimes, you know, for their business model, that's their appropriate method. But when do you hold on to inventory? Why should you hold on to inventory? When does it make sense to pass on good deals? It, once again, goes back to infrastructure. If someone has, like, let's just say those Wakefield, those Haywood Wakefield chairs, someone has like 150 of them, and you can get them for nothing. You don't have a truck. You have no money. You don't have a car. I mean, you don't even have a car. Where are you going to put them? Because, see, this is the thing. When you do stuff like that and you're not prepared, you're going to move them as cheaply as possible. When you move them cheaply as possible, you're going to scratch up the finish, maybe poke holes in the fabric. It's just, you, you know, it's like, well, if you get damaged, that's no problem. And you're just going to kind of kill the deal. If you're not prepared for certain things, you should pass because 
once you put together your business plan and you know that you're going to do this for a while, a warehouse or some type of storage facility is going to become inevitable. It's going to be because you're going to learn that the volume thing works because you can have a unit full of high price stuff that's selling onesies, twosies, threes. Maybe you got a unit of 100 items and you're selling three or four a month, but they're 300 to 1,000 items. There's enough margin there that you can pay for the cost of the warehouse. But if you're always selling smalls and you got a warehouse, you can run into problems. You know, you have to really, really think about your business. I mean, because if your infrastructure isn't appropriate, you may put yourself in the hole trying to do a deal that you can't do. I've seen people do this because it's like it's a good deal. There's money on the table. But by the time they go through all the the, the motions of getting the stuff, moving in, they've had expenses they didn't have before. Then it's like, oh, they're renting a storage unit. And I'll tell you, when you're renting a storage unit and you're not making any money, the first, 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 first of the month comes real quick. It's just like, oh, God, it's the first already. That happens when you're pressed. When you're waiting on the check, oh, no, it's not coming that quick. So definitely some things to think about with your inventory. You should, one, make sure that your inventory, and I even talk about this in the storage auction book. If you're going to be a reseller, first thing every reseller should do is go through their house and get rid of all the BS. You don't need it. It's not, you just get rid of it. Sell it. You'll clear out space for stuff that makes money. But people want to hold on to stuff. That's why I call the blog Urban Pack Rat. Because so many people are pack rats. They have houses full of stuff that's useless. They have no purpose for it. Don't need it. But for some type of sentimental attachment, can't let it go. It's crazy. That's one of the reasons I don't keep a lot of stuff in my life. I have very few things in my life that I don't really need. I have things I want. But, you know, I just want to get to a certain point. I'm selling and I'm moving on because stuff traps you. Now, this is a very important question, and this is another exercise. What kind of seller are you? Yeah, what kind of hustler are you? What, 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 what kind of hustler are you? Do you even know? Have you even asked yourself that question? Because it's time to make a decision today. Are you a discount seller or a value seller? Now, let's be really clear. Both can make a lot of money. There are people who are doing both who are millionaires. Some people are billionaires. But the thing is, both of these people or these companies know their business. They know who they are. If you don't know who you are, you're going to run into problems because what happens is people try to do both. And it's very hard to do both because you're serving two different markets and the markets don't like each other. I'm a value seller being I try to create stuff and I try to raise the price. I, You know, it's like I really do. I really push to raise the price because that forces me to create more value for you instead of going, OK, well, if I discount this, I can sell more in the crowded Internet world. That doesn't always happen. Some cases it does. But give you a great example with books. The common read is that you throw it up on Kindle, just put a cheap price on it. It'll sell like wildfire, right? No, it won't. It will not. Your books on Kindle will sell for a few reasons. If you write a really good book and you write in the appropriate genre and someone who is a, an evangelist reads it, they'll spread the word for you because that's what everyone's hoping for. It's just like, I just hope someone gets this book. It's like word of mouth because word of mouth means you don't have to do shit. Typically, the people who are selling a lot of books are marketing. That's typically how books are sold. And marketing comes by either some bloggers read it and say, hey, you know, this book's awesome. My tribe should check it out. That's a form of marketing. A lot of people don't really look at this. this they call it, a lot of word of mouth actually is contrived. It didn't happen organically. Someone said, hey, you know, if you read this book, you know, I'll slip you a steak dinner. Something like that. It, it just didn't happen. And a lot of times it does. And it feels so good. Oh, the world loves me. And I didn't have to do anything. I just presented myself. Most of us who make a living as writers and make enough money to put some cheese on the Whopper, keep the lights on, and then go out and take vacations and stuff, we market. We market. We market in some shape, fashion, or form. And then with, I will say this with Amazon's ecosystem, if you market a book and you push it 
to a certain level in their ecosystem, Amazon will reach down, grab that book, and run with it. They'll email people about it because it's reached a certain critical mass. And they'll start marketing that book for you. So that can happen too. But you got to ask yourself, which whether you're a discount seller or a value seller. Because if you're a discount seller, and this is a very simple test to let you know what kind of seller you are. If you're always slashing prices, if you're always, you know, you see a good deal at a garage sale, right? And it's already a good deal. You, you see something that they want 50 and you know you're going to make 450 500 bucks. You go ahead and just haggle them down a little bit more, right? You're a discount seller. I know it's like, hey, that's good to do, right? I never did that stuff to people. If I walk, like when I got jewelry and stuff from people, and I could just kind of eyeball grams because I bought a lot of gold, I'm like, okay, she just gave me this, yeah, gave me this stuff for 50 bucks. I'm probably going to make $800 off the scrap gold. I'm sitting around buying other stuff, not even haggling. They're giving me discounts. I'm not asking for them. They're giving them to me because when you understand how money works and you operate from an abundance mindset, you don't have to, oh, bring everyone down. Sometimes you have to play that hard line to make your business run. I'm not saying it's a bad policy. I'm just letting you know who you are as a seller because if you're a value seller, you create value for yourself and you create value for the people that you deal business with because that's one of the reasons I did not participate in any of the joint ventures with people selling my products. I had all kinds of people like, let me sell your books. There wasn't enough value in it for them to do it. And then people were like, oh, you're a hockey talk. It just didn't fit my business plan. When you become a value seller, the value is not just in what you sell. It's in the value of you and of your business. You know, you're like that guy that just because a girl says you can sleep with her, but she doesn't fit your criteria, you walk away. I know ladies going, oh, bullshit. No, yeah, yeah. There are guys, there's a lot of guys who will walk away from sex because that woman does not fit their value proposition. True. Done it. I'll probably do it again. So you, you have to really, really think about that. And you start thinking like, you know, when I was putting together this course, and the reason it's beta, because you show up between four and five, it's like, how much value can I create? Well, I don't know. So I'm going to just take a chance and put out all this awesome information for free. And the thing is, I've already gotten paid from several people who joined the groups, and I'll get paid from even more who will join the groups because I'm trying to create value. You know, the discount thing, you know, and if you've been around the G-verse, you know, I will jack up a price in a heartbeat. And then also the flip side. Like today, I sent out an email uh, the storage auction books 50% off. Why? I wrote that book two, three years ago. Uh, the, storage, the Journey to Storage Auction is an audiobook. I did that last year. But the market's not there. That's called business reality. It's like, yeah, you know, I could think those books are worth 500 bucks. The market isn't there. Why? Because the storage auction craze has finally started to peter out. But when that sucker was going high, that book was selling for 99 bucks. I was selling two and three a day. So, once again, that kind of goes about, you know, information of your business. You know, when, when I saw that the party was over and the fat lady was coming out, she was shuffling out and she's eating on some of those Cheetos and she's looking at me winking like, yeah, I'm about to start bellowing. And then she's, I, I mean, that's just reality. And that you have to do that with some of your products. You may buy something and your research is right at that time and you hold on to it too long and the market shifts and you're going to have to dump that puppy for maybe what you paid for or less. Because the market shifted on you. But once again, that's just business. It's not like, oh, you know, the market said, hey, I don't like so-and-so, so I'm going to shift on. It happens to all of us. So you, you really, really have to think about that stuff. So this is your one of your tests, one of your tasks, so to speak. Are you a discount seller or are you a value seller? Are you always trying to get stuff super cheap or are you trying to create value? Which one are you trying to do? Because I know there will be a lot of questions about that one. All right. Now, this is, once again, because we're repeating, it's time to get rid of all your crap. Even if you're not going to be a reseller, you will experience emotional health improvement. You will experience a greater sense of your home by dumping stuff you don't need. Sell it. Sell what you can. Donate to Goodwill what you can. Blow it out. When you clear out the clutter out of your life, you will be amazed at the emotional clarity that you get. The two are more connected than you know. One of the reasons that I have all of these stories is I, I bought all these units from these people that had so much stuff that they didn't have a life. Their life was stuff. They didn't really have a life. 
I can say this is probably the happiest I've been since the last seven, eight years. And it, cause it's just a different level of clarity about my relationship with stuff. It makes a difference because if you see me walking around, my, I look kind of bummy a lot of times. I really do. I, I really do. Cause I don't care. And I know my value and my value. I don't have to dress up, you know, and, and this is this is going to crack you up. When I do put on clothes, everyone freaks out. They're like, you really look good. <laughs> it cracks me up. And because um, my value is in what I do and in my writing and my videos and doing this stuff for you. That's the value. So I have a whole different value system. And it isn't based on stuff. And that's a great place to be. You thought I was going to let you get out of here without something else? Today, you're going to pick a, on a person, pick a, on a person, or pick a person, a friend, family, foe, and write a thank you letter. Yes, we've done this before. Make it a habit. And also today, you're going to go through your, your customer list and give one of your best customers a value-loaded deal. Now, let's talk about it. Value doesn't mean discount. If you've taken this course for a while, you know exactly what I'm talking about, how to create value. Not discount, but create value. So those are two of your tasks right there. And now we are to the Q&A. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I took a little time off, so I am, uh, <laughs> went way over. Let's see. This is Manny. I suggested to my girlfriend that she starts offering up scale folks in, in the home or offering up Offering up a romantic dinner. She's a certified sous chef at a premium. I just can't figure out how to market such a thing besides tossing it on Craigslist and hoping someone reads it. Okay, Manny, go back to days one through 10 and do the exercises over again. That stuff's there. Danica, remember at the beginning of the course, you were asking us to write thank you letters. I had the bright idea to handwrite them to every single customer who's ever purchased from my store. That's awesome. Took me a week and several hand cramps to get it done, and I got them in the mail last night. Hasn't been 24 hours since they received them, and customers are already contacting me and requesting products. Telling you, this stuff works. It works. It works. Actually, that's a, I mean, that's an awesome way to go over and beyond what was asked. Let's see. Uh, I've sent out the emails. Let's see. I'll send out the whatever emails I have in my inbox. I'll send them out again. All right. I will see. I have sent out the first day I asked for, for put out to the book. I just put a link and send. Out. Some of you need to check your spam folders because sometimes because I have to check mine because sometimes things that shouldn't go in there. But I will send them out again. Uh, Betty, you hit the nail on the head. I first spoke with you back in 2010. I am finally learning to let go of the stuff. My parents were depression era and my mom would always talk about how much she paid for things. And when they passed it, it was difficult to let it go because I heard her in my head. I'm silently separating the memories from the stuff. I don't want my daughter to be weighed down as I was. It could take years to get over that. It t I know it took me a while. Uh, David. 94% of all iOS apps downloaded last year are free email with ad sponsors on the app purchases. In your mind, does this make all the app offers they're doing freemium discount sellers as well as iTunes podcast that are 99 cent? Let's see. Let me look at that again. Okay. Let's talk about that because this is a different kind of game. They're downloading the apps because the more apps that they download, they're getting paid. This is a different game. They're trying to make money from ads. And apparently, a lot of people make money because I know the guy that did, what was that? That bird, fl flaggy bird, flaggy bird, something where people were selling their phones for ridiculous amounts on eBay because the game was on there. He was making like $50,000 a day from ads. So that's a different ball game. That is a strategy. That's not... They create value to get value. So that's a different ballgame. Because the thing is, you don't create these apps for free. A lot of money goes into apps. 
<laughs> as soon as I asked, I knew the answer. That's funny. Uh, Michael, what did you do with all of the mattresses that you got in buying units, especially the ones that are in bad shape that no one wants to buy? We sold most of the mattresses and the ones that were in bad shape that no one wanted to buy. We put them in the free section on Craigslist and people came and got them. <laughs> You've never had a problem with mattresses. Uh, Angela. Hey, Glendon, how do you compare MailChimp to Constant Contact? Which do you like? I actually use Get Response. Uh, MailChimp would be good for you to start with because they give you 2,500 names for free. Now, this is the thing about using a mail client. Whatever you start with is what you should stay with because when you start trying to move lists, you usually lose people and you don't give them back again. So just think about that. And a lot of them have free trials, so you can just kind of play around with them before you make a commitment. Uh, it's coming from Glendon at theamericanhustler.com. Oh, Flappy Birds. Okay, that's it. Yeah, because there was... Somebody was coming after him for copyright infringement. That's why he disappeared. Flappy Bird. Everybody's got Flappy Bird. Uh, Richard, is there a YouTube reseller I can learn from who does bigger items of art? Oh, uh, no. And I'm going to tell you why. All of the guys that are really cranking it out and making a lot of money are not on YouTube. And they're not giving up their secrets. Deanna. Starting a local resellers market set for May. How do I raise money for advertising, rent insurance without putting all the money out myself? You can bring on partners. You can do pre-sales. You could do, or you can have a garage sale because you'll still be putting the money out yourself. But I'm going to say, I'm understanding your question that how can I do this without robbing my paycheck? Go ahead, find some stuff in your house you don't need and blow it out and create a operating fund for your business. And also, you may need to go ahead and get into the course because the first few days we talked about how to create sales, how to make money without actually putting money out. Sure thing, Angela. Dwayne, what? you got people to take crappy mattresses? Man, you need to package that ability and sell it. I'm going to tell you a really nasty, grimy story. Had a mattress that had a period stain on it. And it was a silly, pillow top, beautiful mattress. I was heartbroken. Because I could have normally got $250, $400 bucks for that mattress. I was pissed. I didn't want to throw it away. I put it. In the free section, period, mattress, free, come get it. It was gone in two hours. And the couple that came and got it said, oh, we're just going to get two mattress covers and rock on with this. I am not kidding you. I am not kidding you. That, I, dude, man, it, <laughs> we didn't have a problem with them. Only mattresses we had a problem with were those 1960 more silver, more coils than a mattress. And then I had a, guy, a scrap guy. He would come by and get those because he would uh, take the metal out. Jasmine, I'm playing Flappy Bird right now. That's cracking me up. Uh, Byron, what's the major advantage, uh, disadvantage in selling on eBay as opposed to Craigslist? Craigslist, you can't sell everything that you can sell on eBay on uh, you can sell way more stuff on eBay than you can on Craigslist. The second thing is you're going to run into a pricing issue. You may have something like take take iPhones. You can sell an iPhone 150, 160, sometimes 250 if it's new, but you can get way more money on eBay for the same phone because people are buying these phones and they're shipping them overseas. A lot of people don't understand where those phones are going. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, David was like, for the person who wanted to get some money, you can go GoFundMe, Kickstarter, Indiegogo. I will speak on that too. People are starting to get overwhelmed with all of these GoFundMe, Kickstarter. Because the thing with those platforms is if you're going to use one, you need to have a following already. The most successful crowdsourcing, that's what they're called, campaigns, have all been people who had followings already. Like, if you had one of these YouTubers with a million followers and they had some kind of fundraiser, they could potentially make seven figures because they've got the following. 
it's the following, the list, that's, that's where the money is. Okay, you're in New York. Yeah, that bed book problem, that was different. You're just going to have to pay the money and take them to the dump because this is something else. What you have in New York is radically different than what I have here in Georgia. We don't have bed bugs. A whole time in there, because people are talking, I've never seen a bed bug. And I've seen plenty of roaches in units, but I've never seen a bed bug. So you've got a different problem than we do here. And I mean, honestly, if you think the mattresses are infested, you just probably have to get rid of them and burn them. Angela, how do you feel about buying shipping containers secondhand in storage versus you using a warehouse or renting storage space? I've done it. You can use the shipping containers, but the thing is, if they're old, they're going to leak. So that's something you should be aware of. Um, I've known people that get them for 100 bucks a piece, and I'm talking about like a 54-foot-long container. I mean, they're, you know, if you're going to store some that you can wrap up, they're great. But you've got to have, look at this. Where are you going to put it? How easy is it going to be to get that stuff out of there to where you want to sell it? So there's a lot of questions. I mean, I think if you've got the space and the situation, they're great. Also, you got to have someone bring it to you. Angela's doing garage sales from home. Uh, Glennon, the byproduct of this webinar is I've gotten more done in my life in the last two weeks than I have in the last five years. Lots of stuff in selling channels with post number at the end of the course. That's the reason I designed this course with an action component because this is my yeah this is my fifth year doing this and i know there's a lot of good people out there and i would do a course and i would put the information and i actually had this conversation with someone who tried to screw me it's like what can you do to get people moving because the thing is if you keep moving and it becomes a habit you're just going to see some awesome things in your life and this goes back to what i'm saying about creating value because if because right now there's about 50 people who are past 2500 bucks from a free course if that is not a sign that this stuff works, I don't know what it is. Sure thing, Angela. Uh, Betty says, most jurisdictions will pick up bulk trash, i.e. mattresses, if they're wrapped in plastic. Go to a source like Sleepy's or Mattress Discounter and ask them for the plastic. Wrap it up and let the state pick it up. Hey, if that works. Thanks, Betty. And Tony says, you got to be aware of the extreme temps with those containers. Now, that's another. It, actually, that happens with outside storage units, too. Because I remember buying a unit and getting in there, and some people have left water in a washer, and that sucker was frozen solid. It was just a big block of ice. I had to wait till that sucker melted to drain it out. Fortunately, it still worked. I was a little concerned about that. Jasmine, when you said that people change on you when you start self-employment, I thought automatically that that didn't pertain to me. I was wrong. I told my great aunt and she was more apathetic under the guise of being encouraging than anything else. The irony is that I always had to keep my ego in check because I have this entrepreneur mindset and other people don't have. And I would rather slave making minimum and and they would rather slave making minimum wage. It's crazy to me that people think the opposite. I'm telling you. When you get on this path, expect all kinds of stuff. Okay, um, let me say it like this. You've got a person like your great aunt. She could be 60, 70, 80 years old. When you have someone who's in, who's been the same way for decades, it may they may be a wrap. You can't introduce anything new to them if their mind will not open up to it. I'm telling you, I get... I get people who disrespect me. I, I had someone that was dating said, all you do is sit around and act like you work and play on your computer. I'm telling you, people cannot wrap their hands around this stuff because it's so foreign to them because their mind operates from a scarcity principle that there's only certain ways that you can do stuff. Like, you know, there's many ways that you can love a person. There, You can love a person close. You can love them from afar. There's many ways to do stuff, but no. I'm telling you, this will blow your mind on the people who will flip out on you when you start doing better than them or just gain freedom. I mean, just gain freedom. You will be shocked. 
Dwayne. Ditto, same here. Got a lot done around the house. Yeah, uh, I'm behind, but I'm moving instead of waiting for things to, to move for me. I'm doing the seminars instead of working most evenings, but everything I'm learning here is adding the foundation of the business. Excellent. Uh, Betty says it may be jealousy for real. They hate it because they want it and don't have it. David, all of the people that are close to me are cl are that are close minded like that toxic or are all these people that are close minded like that toxic or can they be brought along on bo board until they're ready to accept a new way? No, you can show them. Dude, I had someone who was getting ready to file bankruptcy and I rolled over to their house in a brand new BMW that I paid cash for, for in the, from the storage auction business. And they were still like, I don't know about that storage auction stuff. I sat there and gave them the whole game. And they like, they went ahead and filed bankruptcy. Didn't talk to me. I'm telling you, people get locked into, there's only a few ways to do something. Uh, Michael, I bought a storage unit full of 1,000 to 2,000 classical vinyl records. Any advice how to sell? As a lot to piece it out on eBay. You're not going to like this answer. You may have one album in there worth four hundred to a thousand or two or three thousand dollars. The only way that you're gonna find this out and not screw yourself is to create a system. Every day I'm gonna look up 50 albums, and over a period of weeks you will get it done. Because I'm telling you, you've got that many albums, you're gonna let something awesome go. Now a record guy can come in and go through that stuff real quick and be like, Yeah, I'll take everything, and he's buying that collection for one album. You're going to have to do the work. That's that's the hard part about getting something like that. And, you know, it's like you can easily put a list on Craigslist, got all these albums, some for 500 bucks, and then some record guy comes and he sees four albums. Oh, shit, that's a thousand. Yeah, I'll take it. And he'll probably like, yeah, will you take 350? <laughs> uh, Deanna, my business slogan, turn your clutter into cash. Push the everyone has Two hundred to twenty-five hundred dollars worth of stuff they no longer have use for. It's true. You go to upscale neighborhoods; those people have thousands of dollars. Like the, the, one of my clients, the stuff she sends me pictures of and stuff. I'm just, and this is just in her house. But this has all those kids, all of those clothes, and they they're name brand people. So I, I definitely can see that. It is four fifty-six, and I am like going long here. So. Let me do this because I didn't do it before because everyone asked me this. This is how you will get into the paid course because the thing is, if you're new, you're going to have to do the paid course or you're going to be confused on some things. So this is, this is where it is. Oh. Okay. Under the video. If you want to go per month, that's that one. Now, with that, I have to add you to the Facebook group, which may take two to 24 hours. Because for some reason, a lot of people shop in the middle of the night. It's amazing. And this is Lifetime. Once again, Facebook group. Then, if you want to start like tonight, you this one's already set up. You go ahead, you pay, and you can start watching videos tonight. Because a lot of people hate Facebook for some reason to spice it so you can sign up there and also if you don't have an audiobook be sure to get the audiobook but under any video is how to get in let's see if there's any more questions there are none all right this is glendon cameron thanks for coming out sharing your day with me i appreciate it i will be back here tomorrow 4 p.m and uh yes i'll send out the email and i will see you on the good side You hear from uh, the evil one? Yeah. Oh, I'm feeling guilty. <laughs>